thought I'd try a book review first for this channel, but the other day I made a, a video about did Lemmy play real bass or rhythm guitar on the bass, to which I concluded that he played neither, he played Lemmy. But anyway, in that video I mentioned the um, the book Lemmy, The Definitive Biography by Mick Wall. And I wanted to review that book just because I, I enjoyed it so much. I still go back to it from time to time to reread it. I mean, it was released, I don't think it was released long after Lemmy's death. So it's been out a few years now. But um, yeah, I also before I do if you have possible plot spoilers or something, but it's not like, you know, I don't know. Obviously, did Motorhead get famous or not? Or something. I mean, it's not exactly going to be anything like that, but there's some stuff in there that, yeah, it should be read first down maybe or something. Not not reported via a book review. But anyway, so Mick Wall, um, he was friends of, uh, he'd known, well, yeah, he, was, he seemed, he was quite friendly with Lemmy. They certainly knew, knew each other. And there's videos of him on YouTube way back, like in the in the eighty mid eighties, where he's interviewing Lemmy, and Lemmy gives Mick Wall a pair of Wendy Williams shorts, <laughs> or cut off denim, whatever you call me, you know, denim shorts and stuff. Apparently, Mick Wall had a thing for Wendy Williams or something. But uh, so they know they knew they knew each other for a long time, and Mick Wall puts puts these various meetings in throughout the book. Um, and there's a really good, really funny thing when he meets Lemmy. I think it's the start of the book. He, he's due to meet Lemmy in uh, 99, 99, 2000, when Lemmy, if he had that, he collapsed on tour and he, he ultimately got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Not that it really made him change his ways. But uh, when when um, Mick Wall meets him, Lemmy's kind of recovering. And uh, Lemmy said, tell me the truth, Mick. You know, you've been told I'm dying, haven't you? So that's why you come to see me. But And he apparently went, Lemmy said, look at me. Do I look like I'm fucking dying? And Mick Wall said that was hardly a fair question. Lemmy looked like shit for years. <laughs> uh, there's a wonderful little 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 bits like that throughout the book that shows he, he did know the man Lem. Um, I mean, I it's the thing to say about this book is compared to Lemmy's um, autobiography, White Lion Fever, which was fantastic as well. But that was very much Lemmy just charging his way through his life story. He, he doesn't hang around when he doesn't go into any great depth for any time. I, 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 I think is my opinion of it. Mick Wall, like um, Doug Smith, the manager, when you read uh, Lemmy's definitive biography, it's, it shows the amount of, I mean, I know he's a manager, but he was in, he was, he was in and out and in and out and they, they, they fell out and they argued and stuff. And I think Lemmy just mentions him in passing two or three times in White Lion Fever. But I anyway, mean, Mick Wall, and he interviews Doug Smith at, at length, you know, about how he, they, they pissed each other off and stuff. Um, I mean, Filthy Animal Taylor hated Doug Smith to his dying day, really virulent hatred of him. So I hope he dies and stuff. I was, I've seen that in an interview. Um, whereas Fast Eddie Clark made it up with him because they, I think they blamed Doug Smith for taking their money or something. But in Mick Wall's book, Doug Smith sort of details exactly what happened to their money. Like, Fast Eddie just had a roadie on all the time. Motorhead could be off the road for months. And uh, he, he still had the roadie. He was paying him a weekly wage, you know. And Doug Smith was saying, go and you know, get, let him do other work. He can come back to you and stuff like that. So they, 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 it sounds like they absolutely pissed money away. I mean, that's Doug Smith's story, but it does, does sound quite plausible. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's obviously Mick Wall. He's enthralled to the the classic lineup. Uh, the, I think he calls it the Three Amigos. You know, the Kill Mister Clark Taylor years, and he's he's a bit dismissive for my for my tastes about what came after. I mean, he, he chronicles the Robbo period perfectly. In fact, Robbo, he, he could just take a bottle of Jack Daniels and just down it in one. And by the end, uh, he was just an absolute basket case on on booze and drugs. And they had they so they used that as an excuse to cancel the tour because uh, one thing that's made obvious in Mick Wall's book was just how catastrophic Eddie Clark leaving or being chucked out um, was on Motorhead's just their ticket sales live it just went, it just tanked straight away and then of course then they got Robbo who wanted to wear cut off shorts and whatever ballerino ballerina shoes or whatever the, whatever he was doing um, but talking about fast Eddie Clark leaving or getting chucked out. Mick Wall knowing Fast Eddie Clark, he gets a lot of input into this book. Um, and 
Foster doesn't deny that it was sometimes difficult. But he said he tried to make it up for them. The last gig they did was New York, Eddie's last stand. And apparently he was put, he was put in a different room from the main dressing room. And he was isolated from the after show party and stuff. And eventually he made his way upstairs to this party. And he tried to speak to Lemmy and Filthy. He said, come on guys, let's put this behind us and just carry on. And apparently they said, no man, screw you. In harder words, you know, get get lost. You know, we're done with you. Um, and it seems like Eddie sort of doesn't deny that he could be difficult. And I think he was often called an emotional drunk um, when he had the alcohol problem. Speaking of which, but one thing that comes out, it comes across, is that when if you were out of Lemmy's circle, no matter how close you'd been to him, Phil Fenimore Taylor said the same thing. He said he was the closest they'd been, you know, brothers from brothers from another mother, basically. Brother, a brother from another mother, the two of them. He said, as soon as he's out of the band and stuff, and Lemmy was just different. And he said, Fast, it seems like Fast Eddie Clark had that. Lemmy sort of took against him for some reason about the time of making the Iron Fist album, when Fast Eddie Clark was stressed trying to produce it and stuff. And Lemmy started calling this name Fancy Bollocks. <laughs> it's it's Fast Eddie never quite worked out what it went on. Did, or maybe he, he took, he, he, he pulled this, this, this woman that Lemmy was after, or there was something weird like that, but Lemmy just completely took against him, just started calling him fancy bollocks. And it's almost, he did that thing with, um, Wendy Williams and the plasmatics, you know, stand by a man, almost like he doggedly pursued that because he just knew how much it was winding fast Eddie Clark up. Fast Eddie Clark hated him, you know, hated it after the iron fist, which wasn't that successful album. Fast Eddie, apparently this is, this is all from Mick Wall's book. Fast Eddie said he wanted to do a, a, a blues, a, a load of blues covers, an album of blues covers, like Motet Go Back to the Blues type thing, just to give them some breathing space. And Hoochie Coochie Man was one song mooted. It's interesting that they covered Hoochie Coochie Man on live a few times with um, Brian Robertson. As a, as one, as, that is a good, it's a live track. It's on YouTube and stuff. Um, Hoochie Coochie Man, Motorhead. That's really good. And uh, yeah, so so um, Mick will, he, he definitely, I don't know what the word is, eulogises, speaks glowingly about the, um, the Three Amigos period, the real rags to riches when they, they, li they, they literally didn't have enough to eat. They'd like, if they want to been frying for a pan, they always get bread and just rub it around in the, in the pan to try and like get a bit of food and stuff. Um, and then, but when it changes first, when the lineup changes, first of all, uh, with Robbo and then later with Pete Gill and the two guitarists and, and Mick Wall says, oh, it's never going to be the same. And which is kind of true, but he does, I don't mean talking about Wurzel. He said Wurzel was another decent enough guitarist. Like he's saying his real appeal was the fact that he was the man of the people and his, 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 his gleaming smile and you know he's quite witty in the way he raced around on stage and that which I think did Wurzel does Wurzel a massive disservice Wurzel wrote the real crunching riffs and Motorhead and I think he shouldn't you know, not, he was another decent enough guitarist no he was a fantastic songwriter and riff writer and stuff and he really he gave another dimension to Motorhead I think so there, there is that kind of you know not, nothing could ever be the same after Eddie and Phil, which is, it's, it, to me, it's always like too easy a thing to say. It's, I, mean, I, I always think Lemmy could have, you know, the band could have become, stra they, it could have, it could have like become supremely successful after Eddie and it, but it would never be the same because it wasn't Eddie and Phil. It's like he was doomed whatever he did, even if he got you know, superbly more famous after it, which of course they didn't. I mean, by the late 80s, that's something Mick Wall says, they're trying to find record labels and, they're viewed as, to quote his thing, a broken down band um, until the move to LA and they sort of kind of get a, a restart, as it were, because of the 1916 album. Um, so he, after that, it kind of it, it kind of takes into the 2000s and then ultimately Wurzel leaving. He doesn't spend a lot of time on Wurzel leaving, funnily enough, Mick Wall, which was that. He said that he'd had enough of touring America or something, and but there wasn't. There was a bit. There was a big bust up with them, 
Um, but what, one thing that comes out through that book is that Lemmy was not a, a good person to make an enemy of, or if you perceived you were becoming an enemy or threatening him in any way. Uh, there was there was quite an ego there. He he played this uncaring, well, sort of easygoing Jack the Lad type rock star. But I think that beneath that was a real sort of you were on his side or you weren't. There was kind of no in between. Um, and a few people fell foul of that, uh, as is obvious in the book. Um, so he interviews a lot of the, the star players, Mick Wall, because he knows him through his career, so like um, Brian Robertson and stuff. I think he was around his flat, drinking with him in his flat when, when he's doing the interviews for this book. Fast Eddie, I said before, Doug Smith, various people. And he talks of uh, some woman, a woman in New York, some arty set that Lemmy got in with in the 80s. They said they used to they used to do a big roast dinner for all the English expats out there or something. And Lemmy used to help out while drinking white wine, uh, drinking Jack Daniels and snorting, you know, whatever. Yeah, but uh, there's uh, that nice little touches like that that really round off the book. Um, not very few. I think it's just stuff that doesn't it, it that obviously isn't right. It's kind of it's a bit. Um, I'm picking at being nitty picky here, nitpicking, nitty picky, nitpicking. But stuff like he says, Wurzel was 30 when he joined. He wasn't. He was 35. Stuff about it. That's a bit anoraki. But there's little um, things like that a few times. But it, it's no, uh, it's no big deal. For the book as a whole, I think it's just really fantastic. Which I'm doing this um, video, and it was one book I bought along with, I think it's Overkill, The Untold Story of Motorhead by Joel MacGyver or something. But I think it's Overkill, The Untold Story of Motorhead, which is absolute crap. And it was like really expensive, it was like £10. And right at the start of the second chapter, it's like a cut and paste job. This guy just releases, apparently he releases biographies of bands, he just cuts and paste stuff off the net. And by the second chapter, it said um, it starts off with Filthy Animal Taylor going to see Lemmy when he was in Hawkwind when Filthy was 12. It's like, no, that was Phil Campbell. And that's not Anorak. It's, and it, it doesn't make any sense, you know, and that's someone who's supposed to, you know, is releasing a book. It got even that long. So after reading that, well, I returned it for a refund, which is not so I often do. But um, that was just like, taking the mick. So anyway, after that effort, um, let me the definitive biography was a real treat. I really enjoyed it. And I, I like rereading. It's one of those books you can go back to and read little bits of pieces again, just, you know, to make... Give yourself a smile and stuff, and show just what the the character Lemmy was, and the the way all the, the all the all the many people he, he came into contact with throughout his life, and you know what they helped create, and all that sort of thing, how it all sort of came together and stuff. Just brilliant stories in there. Um, so my advice would be really to to get it and read it because it's really good.